صلوات على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ان شاء الله now i would like to request sayed haider so ان شاء الله he can uh, um, he can bless us with his uh, wisdom and with his words alhamdulillah we've been getting blessed all this muharram with uh, his lectures uh, so ان شاء الله without any further ado i would like to request sayed uh, haider hasnain salawat ala muhammad wa ali muhammad For all of the shuhada who have watered this blood, who have watered this religion with their blood so that we could have it today, please recite Surah Al-Fatiha ma'a salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله بجميع محامده كلها على جميع نعمه كلها والصلاة والسلام على عبده المرتضى ورسوله المجتبى وحبيبه المصطفى الذي سماه في السماوات أحمد وفي الأرض أبا القاسم محمد وعلى الأتيبين من آله البرر سيما حجة الله الباقية Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the human being in the Quran, there are two words that he usually uses. The first word is the word bashar, and the second word is the word insan. We understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has revealed this noble Qur'an in his infinite wisdom in order to guide mankind until the day of judgment has chosen the words he uses very carefully. And therefore there are lessons to be learned from every word of the noble Qur'an. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer to the human being as al-insan and what is the meaning of that word al-insan comes from the word an-nisyan that is the stronger opinion of experts of the arabic language an-nisyan means to forget means forgetfulness there is also another opinion that states that no, al-insan comes from the word al-uns, which means closeness and intimacy. Why would the word al-insan come from the word al-uns and what is the connection? The connection is that 
The human being is a being that seeks intimacy and closeness. We discussed in one of the previous sessions that before Adam السلام, descended to this physical realm, Allah gave him a spouse. He required a spouse. He couldn't live alone. In this realm of physicality, in the dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us to get married and begin families. Because man requires closeness, companionship, intimacy. As for the akhirah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those believers who go to paradise are given spouses if their spouse in this world did not enter paradise. If both the man and the woman were a believing couple, they go to paradise together. Because a human being is a being that can't live alone. He or she requires intimacy, closeness from other human beings. And of course, a deeper kind of intimacy, a spiritual intimacy with the Lord of the heavens. And the religion comes, Islam comes, and guides us regarding these matters, how to achieve both. However, the stronger opinion is that the word al-insan comes from the word al-nisyan, which means to forget. Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call the human being the he being that forgets? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. You see, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even created the human being, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our father Adam alayhi salam, he announced to the angels, Inni ja'alun fil ardi khalifa. This is the verse of the Quran. Surely I am appointing a khalifa, a representative of myself upon this earth. The angels objected. They said, will you place in this earth one who will cause bloodshed? One who will cause corruption? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I know what you do not know. But that's not our topic for tonight. The part I'd like to focus on is why did the angels object? The angels are beings of light. They are pure intellect. As we discussed in one of the previous sessions when we spoke about freedom, it wasn't out of ego because they don't have any ego. They really didn't understand. Why didn't they understand? Allama Taba Tabai rahmatullahi alayhi comes and he didn't say it in these words, but I'm saying it in these words. It's as if he says, I don't need to refer to anything outside the Quran to give you that answer. I'll tell you why the angels objected right from these five words, Inni ja'alun fil ardi khalifa. As for Allah appointing a khalifa, a representative, there is no objection for that. Why would they possibly object? The problem they saw was in these two words, fil ard, in the physical realm, the realm of physicality, alam al alam al this dunya. The angels knew the nature of physicality. They knew that by default, a being that is present in this realm will be pulled towards bloodshed and corruption. That was the problem. It was the place Allah wanted to put this Khalifa. The nature of matter is such that it leads you to be that way. Why is that? Because being present in this world of physicality causes an-nisyan, forgetfulness. It's related that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam recite salawat. It's related Imam al-Sadiq salam said regarding the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam that the Messenger of Allah would recite, perform istighfar, ask Allah's forgiveness, say astaghfirullah 70 times every single day without having committed any sin. When some of the companions asked, Ya Rasulullah, why do you recite istighfar? 
In other words, you speak to us, you spend time with us, you're here to guide us, and then you go and do istighfar. We don't understand. Is it a sin for you to sit with us? And it's related, the Messenger answered along the following lines, that when I sit with you, when I'm present with you, even though it's for the sake of your guidance, that's understood, even though it's what Allah wants me to do, the very nature of being in the presence of individuals that belong to this realm is what? Is that my heart begins to get covered. When I recite istighfar, that covering from the heart is lifted. This is the nature of the physical realm. You don't have to wait to do a sin to say astaghfirullah. This dhikr, this istigh, dhikr of istighfar is so powerful. It makes the heart so radiant. It lifts the veils from in front of the hearts. We need this dhikr while being present in this realm of physicality. In any case, the angels objected because they knew the nature of alam al maddah of the dunya, the physical realm. It would cause the human being to forget. Today, man has forgotten his identity. If you ask someone, if I ask you, if I ask myself, who are you? The normal response is what? My name is whatever your name is. But if I say to you, that's your name, who are you? We start looking for another label we can hide behind. Oh, I'm a man, I'm a woman. No, that's your gender, who are you? I am this many years old, that's your age, who are you? I'm from this country, that's where you were born, who are you? I'm from this family, that's your family lineage, who are you? And the honest answer is what? I don't know. I don't know who I am. It's related that Amir al Mu'mineen, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, states the following I am in bewilderment, I am amazed by a person who searches for something that he has lost. You lose your keys, you search for them, right? You lose your phone, you search for it. You lose a document, you search for it. Whatever we lose, we search for that. To find that thing, if it's important and valuable to us, it's related, the Imam says, I am amazed, astounded, bewildered at that person. He searches for something that he has lost, that he's lost his own self, yet he doesn't search for it. It's not a priority. It's not important. You know the problem with those, many of those who speak about human rights, you know what the problem is? You haven't defined what that word means. You haven't defined the human being for us to speak about the rights of the human being. This is why Islam in its laws that it presents to govern mankind differs with those laws based on the materialistic worldview because Islam is based on a very profound understanding of what al-insan, the human being, is. In any case, the angels objected because they knew being present in this realm would cause an nisyan and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called us al-insan, one who continuously forgets. The human being forgets who he is, who she is. We forget our own identity, our own reality. This is the reason, by the way, th that many human beings, and sadly, very sadly, many Muslims are included in this, feel that their race is superior to other races, that their country is better than any other country. They don't allow their children to marry someone from a different culture. Why? Because you think that's who you are, right? You think the place you were born, the place your parents are from, that's your identity. Because you've mistaken yourself for something you are not. How can we find out who we are? 
How can I find my true identity? This is one of the reasons that human beings need revelation, al-wahi. One of the biggest aims of the Quran is to introduce you to your own self. You don't know who you are. I don't know who I am. I need to be introduced to myself. And the Quran is filled with verses that introduce us to us, that introduce the human being to himself, to herself. So what is the human being? What is Al-Insan? When we look at the Quran, we find that the human being cannot be defined without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot speak about waves in the ocean without first understanding what the ocean is. You cannot speak about the rays of the sun without understanding what the sun is first. You can't know what a sun ray is unless you know what the word sun means. Similarly, you can't know what al-insan is, the human being is, without first knowing the one who created al-insan. Why do I say that? Because you see, the physical form of Adam alayhi salam this is understood from the verses of the Noble Qur'an. The physical form of Adam salam, was present before the angels. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the angels, after I blow into Adam, of what? وَنَفَخْتُ fihi min ruhi. After I blow into Adam of my own spirit, فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ express humility before him by doing sajda towards him. You see, we face the Kaaba when we do sajda, don't we? Why do we do that? Do we worship the Kaaba? Of course not. We worship what the Kaaba represents, which is, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, our attention is towards the Kaaba and this Attentiveness towards the Kaaba helps our hearts become attentive towards the one it represents. Similarly, the angels didn't worship Adam. He was their Kaaba. This human being that Allah created became the Kaaba of angels. They sought nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by humbling themselves before Adam alayhi salam. But when, after Allah blew into Adam of his spirit. Now the verses of the Quran explain one another as we've discussed in previous sessions. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have a house that we call the Kaaba the house of Allah. We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have a hand though the Quran mentions Yadullahi fawqa aidihim. The hand of Allah is above their hands. We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have a throne, but the Quran mentions, وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ His throne covers all existence. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala similarly, does, similarly doesn't have a spirit. So what is the point of this verse? The point it's making is that there is a divine element within the human being, which Allah has attributed to his own self. And that element made the human being so special. And so valuable that angels, beings made of light, nur, had to be submissive towards that. Not towards the body of Adam, but rather towards his spiritual reality. This is who you are, O oh insan. This is who you are. That spirit is present within every single one of us. Therefore, we find in the Noble Qur'an that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فاذكروني أذكركم Remember me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Remember me, in return I will remember you. As a result of your remembrance of me, you will be remembered. 
in another verse of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about forgetting Allah. See, al-insan, al-nisyan, the being who forgets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the following. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله Don't be like those who forgot Allah What happened when they forgot Allah? This is extremely important ولا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله Don't be like those who forgot Allah What happened when they forgot Allah? What was the result of their forgetting Allah? فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنْفُسَهُمْ When they forgot Allah, Allah made them forget their own selves. Allah made them forget their own identity. If you forget Allah, you are, well, don't think you're only forgetting Allah. You'll forget who you are. Why? Because your reality is so connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's impossible for you to remember yourself without remembering him first. Isn't that incredible? This is what the Quran sees the human being to be. You forget Allah, you will be forgotten. You'll forget who you are. You'll forget who you are. This is the real cause of sin in our lives. This is the real cause of why we end up following the shaitan and later blaming ourselves. It is impossible, it is impossible for you to remember Allah and do a sin. You cannot. The reason human beings end up doing sins is because either Either they don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which case, even though that action is sinful, that human being is not sinful. Yes, that human being is not sinful. That action is a sin. But because that human being doesn't know better, it's not counted for him. Or a human being knows about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in the moment that he sins, in that moment he forgets. It is impossible for a human being to know Allah, to remember him and still sin. It is impossible. Therefore, and we will speak about this a little inshallah, therefore, the way to become infallible from sins. Because sadly, we have this idea because things have not been explained to us the way they should have been, that there are only 14 individuals who are infallible and do not commit errors. That's a mistake. Rather, infallibility, being free from sin, pure from sin, has levels. Yes, the Ahl al-Bayt are at the highest level, but every single human being is infallible regarding that which he or she considers ugly. If you say, to someone who doesn't even share a religion, to an atheist, go and eat something very disgusting. That individual is infallible regarding that action. Why? Because he sees it something disgusting. A human being would never consume something he or she finds disgusting and revolting. So Islam comes and raises the level of the knowledge of the human being. Look, just like there are some things in the physical realm that pollute you, that are disgusting and filthy and vile. There are some spiritual things that are disgusting and filthy and vile, so do not pollute yourselves. This is how infallibility works. It's not the case that if an imam or a prophet is about to commit a sin, Jibra'il will come from the heavens and hold his hand back. No! But they've been endowed with the knowledge of the reality of matters. They see how revolting sin is, and therefore they don't even go near it. If we follow them, this will happen for us as well. I will no longer desire to go in that direction. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now, what is the difference, dear brothers and sisters, between al-ilm and al-dhikr? What is the difference between al-ilm, knowledge, and al-dhikr, remembrance? When you gain knowledge, 
you, before gaining that knowledge, were in a state of ignorance, right? You didn't know X. After you gain knowledge, X became known to you. You come out of that ignorance into a state of understanding. You didn't know, and then you came to know. That's what we speak about when we speak about al-ilm, knowledge. What does al-dhikr mean? What does remembrance mean? When you say, I remember now, what's the implication? It means you knew something. Then there was a period of forgetfulness. You forgot about it. And then you paid attention to that knowledge you already had. And that's what we call remembrance, right? The Quran, with all of its verses, calls itself not al ilm knowledge. It calls itself what? Hada dhikr. This is a remembrance. وَمَا هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرٌ لِلْعَالَمِينَ What is this Qur'an except a reminder for existence? Think about that. What's the implication? The Qur'an with all of its greatness calls itself a reminder. What does that imply? It implies, O oh, insan, O oh, human being, there was something you knew, but you've forgotten about it. This Qur'an has come to remind you of the knowledge you already had. Only the Qur'an? No, not only the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the noble Qur'an, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد أنزل الله إليكم ذكرا Allah has revealed to you has sent down for you, has caused to descend towards you a dhikr, a remembrance. What is that remembrance? Rasulan yatlu alaykum ayatillah. A messenger who recites Allah's verses to you. The Quran is called remembrance, dhikr. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, is also referred to as dhikr, as remembrance. His existence is nothing but remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran is saying this. It calls him dhikr, remembrance. That's extremely profound. Extremely profound. He is dhikr. He is remembrance. His existence is divine remembrance. That's why when you speak about him, your heart starts to move. Even if you just speak about his clothing, the way he walked, how he would smile at everyone he came across, how he would say salam to the children, things that seem so mundane, but when you speak about him, the heart starts to move because he is the one doing it. He is remembrance. This is a clear verse of the Quran. That's why when you think of him, your heart begins to remember. It begins to remember Allah as a result. It begins to remember its own self, its own reality. So when you remember Allah, that is when you remember your own self. And when you forget Allah, you will forget your own reality. Because what is al-insan, the human being, except an effect of Allah's mercy? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And that is why the way to spiritual ascension is to always be in a state of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our biggest problem as human beings is nothing except a ghafla and a nisyan, negligence of this remembrance and forgetfulness. Now in the ayah, the verse of Quran we discussed pre in previous sessions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the children of Adam, their spirits, from the loins 
before sending them into this realm, made them witness their own selves, asked, Alastu bi rabbikum? Qalu bala shahidna. Asked, am I not your Lord? We all said, yes, we witnessed. We witnessed that you are our Lord. The verse ends by saying, so don't come on judgment day and say, we were in the ghafla of this. We were in a state of heedlessness regarding this meeting, this knowledge. That is our problem. The heart has forgotten. It just requires dhikr. So Allah sent the Quran. Allah sent the prophets, the, uh, the a'imma as a dhikr for us. If we only come and hold on to this dhikr. But what does that mean practically? What does it mean to be in a state of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because many who left the way of the Quran at Ahlul Bayt fell into the trap of Satan regarding this. They considered themselves to be people of remembering Allah, but Satan had them wrapped around his finger. What does that mean? In the blessed book of Al-Kafi, it's related that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one of his conversations with Prophet Musa alayhi salam stated the following to Musa, O oh Musa, O oh Musa, those who seek closeness to me don't seek closeness with anything better than abstaining from what I have forbidden. The next hadith will explain this further. It's related that the truthful one, Al-Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, stated the following. Recite the salawat. Min ashaddi ma faradallahu ala khalqih dhikrallahi kathira. From the most difficult things Allah has obligated, has made obligatory upon his creation, is remembering Allah with much remembrance. Because we have in the Quran, Udhkurullah dhikran kathira. Remember Allah with much remembrance. We have in other narrations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he set a limit for everything. For prayer, he set a limit. There are five, five, there are five daily prayers that are obligatory. 17 rak'ahs, you have to pray every day if you want to attain your perfection as a human being. If you want to do more, the total comes to how much every day? 51 rak'ahs that we have in the narrations of Ahlul Bayt that our Shia, one of their signs is they pray 51 rak'ahs every single day, not 17, 51. 11, 8 before Fajr, as Salatul Layl. Two after that as Shafa, one after that as Witr, two before Fajr, eight before Dhuhr, eight before Asr, four after Maghrib, and one after Isha. All together coming to 51 rak'ahs. But that's it. That's the limit of Salah. Fasting, there is a limit to how much you can fast. There are some days in the year it's haram to fast. You can't fast every single day. There's a limit. And you can't fast at night. Between two fasts, you have to do something that breaks your fast. But that is halal, of course. Like you have to eat, you have to drink. You can't link two fasts together. You can only fast from when? From sunrise to sunset. There's no such thing as fasting at night. There's a limit to how much you can fast. There's a limit to how much you can go for hajj. There's a limit to how much you can go for umrah. Everything Allah ordained, there's a limit except one thing. Where Allah did not mention any limit. Rather, he said, Remember Allah with much remembrance, as much as you can. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He put no limit on his remembrance. Because the perfect human being is the one who remembers Allah in all conditions. A human being can reach a level. Because a prophet of a nation, of an ummah, of a people, is the best human being from amongst them. It's related to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said that when we sleep, or when I sleep, 
my eyes sleep, but my heart doesn't. One of the secrets mentioned in our narrations of why the prophets, they sleep on their back. The believers are encouraged to sleep on their right side, if possible facing the Holy Kaaba, the way that a dead body is laid in the grave. But the prophets sleep on their back facing the heavens, their heart is facing the heavens. Why? Because they await wahi, revelation, even in their sleep. They are conscious even in their sleep. So it's related to the Imam alayhi salam states that Allah has not made anything obligatory upon his creation harder than remembering him in every condition. Remembering him very often with much remembrance. And then the Imam continues, because when the Imam says this, many misunderstood this concept of dhikrullah, and until today many misunderstand it. They think it means you take, you take a tasbih in your hand, a thousand beads, say Allah, 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 Allah. Astaghfirullah, 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 that's what it means. It's part of it, but not limited to that, as the Imam explains. It's related, he says, لا أعني سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر وإن كان منه I don't mean by this remembrance of Allah saying سبحان الله a lot saying لا إله إلا الله a lot saying الحمد لله a lot saying الله أكبر a lot even though that is part of it the Imam says this is part of it but it's not the whole thing ولا كن what does it mean then to remember Allah with much remembrance? Walakin, rather it means you remember Allah regarding what he has allowed and what he has forbidden. Meaning what? Remember him in your actions. Before we perform an action, you first think, is Allah pleased or not? If he is not pleased, you avoid it. You see, dear brothers and sisters, there is a process in place for man's elevation. There are steps that we have to take. You can't go from level 1 to 100 overnight. Slowly, slowly. It's related to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi stated the following, and I'm paraphrasing, that this religion is very firm. So go into it steadily. Don't jump into it all at once. Go into it steadily step by step what is the first step the first step is correcting your perception of reality when your perception you see reality the way the quran mentions that's the first step why is that the first step look brothers and sisters if there is a journey to be made if you want to get from manchester to london let's say it's the first time you want to make such a journey What's the first thing you do? You look up the route, right? You look at a map. You find out the way, and then you make your journey. You don't just start moving in any direction. So before you know what the path is, before you have a map in your hands, you may accidentally end up getting to London. The chances are extremely slim. The first thing you do is you find a map. Therefore, a person who wants to make the journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first needs to recognize there is an Allah, there is a map, there is a path, right? This is the level of correcting our perceptions of reality. This is the first level. Once you realize who you are intellectually, because the realization of the heart is something else that comes later. You realize intellectually there is an Allah, there is me, there is this journey, and this religion, Islam, is here to help me make that journey. And this is the way to that destination. You realize intellectually, what's the first thing you do? It starts with your actions. The teachers of spirituality say this. The way to, rec to rectify the inward, to purify the inward, begins from the outward. After you realize this intellectually, it begins from your outward actions. This is what the Imam is speaking about in this hadith. 
Remembrance of Allah starts with your actions. You remember him in your actions. How do you remember him in your actions? Before every single action, you first think, is it halal, is it haram? If it's haram, you avoid it. Now, what is permissible, what is forbidden by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not limited to the things we often think. Having a halal income, for example, is part of dhikrullah. It's part of dhikrullah. Hurting another mu'min or mu'min, a believer, is absolutely haram. It's not the case that eating pork is super haram or drinking alcohol is super haram. But being hurtful to another mu'min is, mm, this, it's okay, it's, only it's haram. You wouldn't eat pork, you wouldn't drink alcohol, so why do you hurt other believers with your tongue? A lot of us have grown up hearing about the tortures of the grave, which has an explanation. The reality is, the realm of barzakh, the realm of the grave, which isn't the physical grave, it's about the journey of the soul of the human being. There are no tortures in the grave waiting. You take your tortures with you. The scorpions and the snakes and all the things you've heard about in Majalis, that was your backbiting. That was your spitting venom with your words in the hearts of other believers. It will come back to you. The scorpion was inside you. It was your reality. What happens at death is you come face to face with who you are. That's the scary part about death. Many things we consider to be completely halal are completely haram. Especially when it comes to our relationships with other people. How are you with your spouse? We spoke about this some nights ago. How are you with your spouse? When's the last time you told her that you loved her? You appreciated her for cooking, which she doesn't have to do, she doesn't want to. Thanking one another. When's the last time you respected your husband? Even if a believer so much as frowns at another mu'min, without reason, of course, and that hurts the heart of that mu'min, that believer has to answer for it. My wife, who's also a Hausa student, she told me the following story from one of her teachers, a very, very pious lady, that this teacher of hers, when she was younger and she recently got married, she had a sister-in-law who also recently entered the family at a similar time. These two became close friends. They were both very pious. Sometimes their mother-in-law would be there, and she had a certain particular habit. You know, some people have certain particular habits. I don't know exactly what it was. I don't remember. She would speak in a certain way. She would mention something. She would say she would do something that was a little bit funny. And these two, they would sometimes look at each other and, you know, just giggle a little bit. She said, very sadly, my sister-in-law passed away quite early on in that marriage. She said, one night I saw a dream. And I saw my sister-in-law in my dream. And I asked, how are you? How is your condition in that realm? And she replied by saying, do you remember when our mother-in-law she used to, you know, have that particular habit. And we used to look at each other. I have to give answer even for that glance. This part of dhikrullah, remembering Allah. And the Imam's telling us it's hard. It's one of the hardest things Allah made obligatory upon his creation. That's why we don't reach spiritual stations. Not because the door isn't open. But because there are many things we make halal for ourselves that are forbidden, especially when it comes the way 
we treat others. Your mother is a believer. Your father is a believer. Your spouse is a believer. Your children are believers. Did you know? Would anyone? Would any Muslim go? Would any Muslim ever go to the Kaaba and graffiti the Kaaba? Would any Muslim ever go and throw stones at the Kaaba or shoot the Kaaba? You couldn't imagine that, right? But the narrations of Ahlul Bayt inform us that the believer, the mu'min, the value of a believer is more in Allah's eyes than the Kaaba. And we shoot other mu'mineen so easily. We destroy the reputations, we slander, we backbite, we gossip. Shedding tears for Am Hussein is not going to get rid of those sins. That's haqqun nas. That person has to forgive you. Why is it that in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the day of judgment that it is the day يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ Not only will relatives not want to be with one another, they will run from one another. The day a man will run from his own brother and his mother and his father and his spouse and his children. Why, will, why the running? I understand everyone's preoccupied with their own deeds. They're afraid of the accounting. But why run when you see someone you recognize? One of the spiritual teachers in Qum explained this by saying the following. Do you know why people will run when they see people they knew in dunya? Because of the rights of those people that they had taken. They are afraid on judgment day that person will come demanding their rights. Because I oppressed my mother. I oppressed my father, my spouse, my children, my brothers, my sisters, my friends. I oppressed them. I hurt them. On that day, people are only thinking about themselves. Meaning what? Meaning, if for example, I backbited regarding one of my believing brothers or slandered one of my, slandered one of my believing brothers, what will happen on that day? On that day when I'll need every single good deed I can get to be saved. If that person sees me on the day of judgment, they will come saying what? They will come reminding me of the wrong I did to them. Yes, demanding their rights. You slandered me in the dunya. You spread rumors about me. And the only way you can enter paradise is what? Is by making that person pleased with you. How will that person get pleased with you? They will say, for example, I'll forgive you if you give me the reward of all of your night prayers. I'll forgive you if you give me the reward of all of your good actions. But you have no choice because you want to go to paradise. As a result, your level in Jannah will decrease. So is it worth it? Is it? just for a moment of pleasure and dunya is it worth it this is why the quickest way to spiritual ascension is remembering allah number one and remembering death in every moment because it makes you real brings you back to reality so it's related the imam said i don't mean doing all those adhkar with your tongue, though that is part of it, rather remembering Allah in what he has forbidden, what he has allowed. It begins with what? Your outward actions. First, learn the outward actions of the prayer. Learn when you stand for prayer, before you say takbiratul ihram, before you say Allahu Akbar, be still. Not you're running Allahu Akbar. Still, stillness. Learn the physical form. This helps you in your spirituality. You stand still, you face the Qibla, make your heart attentive, Allahu Akbar. In a state of stillness, this is the first step. What happens when you perform good deeds in this manner? The effect of that good deeds goes into your heart. What is the effect of those good deeds? 
the veils in front of the heart begin to be lifted. What is the effect of evil deeds? It affects your heart. It veils your heart. You forget who you are, what you are. Just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says regarding the Day of Judgment, Rather, their evil deeds covered their hearts. As a result, what happens on Judgment Day? When your reality is seen, when you come face to face with your own reality, Kalla innahum arrabbihim yawma idhilla mahjubun. Because they veiled their own selves by means of their evil deeds, on judgment day they will be veiled from their Lord and denied the pleasure of witnessing his beauty and entering into his mercy. Because judgment day is nothing but the reality of this dunya. Sallallahu alayka ya Aba Abdullah Sallallahu alayka Ya Aba Abdullah Sallallahu alayka Ya Aba Abdullah These nights have returned A year we have yearned, Fatima. Take us once again to Nainawa, where hearts are upturned, Fatima. Where hearts are upturned, Fatima. Take us once again, Fatima, to the land of pain, Fatima. These sands brought the tears of Mustafa, where his rose was slain, Fatima. What will I do when I get to that land? Only cry, no, pledge my allegiance. What will I say when I get there? And there we shall say, Fatima, on this path we'll stay, Fatima. I swear, I swear by who? By your Zainab and Abu Fadl, till the judgment day. Fatima, till the judgment day. Fatima, la ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Ya Abu Abdullah. Do you want to hear the musibah? Of the sons of Al Hassan. If so, let's visit the land of Medina. The Musiba begins there. In which moment? In the moment that Abba Muhammad Al Hassan ibn Ali, the poison is running through his veins. 
Jones. He's asking for a ball. Lady Zainab is present. Aba Abdullah Al Hussein is present. He's looking at his beloved, at his Imam, at his brother, the flower of Rasulullah in that condition. He's shedding tears and weeping. In that moment, it's related. Al Hassan turns to his brother and says, I'm paraphrasing. Do you weep for me? But la there is no day like your day, O Abu Abdullah. I'm certain the gaze of his brother never left his mind. The shining face of Al Hassan never left his mind. I think one of the hardest moments on the day of Ashura was when Qasim, the son of Al Hassan, entered the tent of Abu Abdullah. Oh, Uncle, give me permission. Oh, Qasim, don't do this to the heart of Al Hussain. La ilaha illallah, you're the orphan of his brother. Ya Abu Abdullah, tell me. When you looked at the face of Qasim, did you see Qasim ibn al Hassan? Or is it that you looked in his eyes? You saw your brother, Abba Muhammad Hassan ibn Ali. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. On the night before Ashura, it's related Abu Abdullah gathered his companions. He told them to leave. Some of them left, but many remained. It's related that this teenager rises. His face, the enemy said this, his face was like the moon when it's shining. What does he say? Oh, uncle, will I also be from those who attain martyrdom? Will I also be from the Shahada tomorrow? It's related to Abdullah says, Oh, Qasim, how do you see death? How do you see death in this path? Qasim ibn al Hassan, a young teenager, replies with the following words Death to me is Ahla min al to me martyred in your way is sweeter to me than honey. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. In the maqtal it's written, there are two moments, there are two moments on the day of Ashura, when Abu Abdullah his nephews call him. Both of them use the same statement. Both of them use the same words. The first moment was after Qasim ibn al Hassan had gone to the battlefield. He was fighting the enemies. Dust was arising. It was difficult to see what's happening. All of a sudden, a voice rises in Karmala. What does this voice say? Ya <laughs> oh, uncle, the maqtal says of Abdullah charged at the enemy like an angry lion. He came to the side of his nephew, but it was too late. He takes Qasim ibn al Hassan in his arms. He says, Oh, nephew, it is difficult for your uncle that you call him, but he doesn't respond. Or that he responds, but his response doesn't avail you. No, no, Allah. But this wasn't the only flower of Hassan ibn Ali that presented itself as a sacrifice. Qasim had a younger brother called Abdullah ibn Al Hassan, a child even younger than Qasim. It's related in those final moments when Abu Abdullah. 
had been surrounded from every direction. When he was the cap of their swords and spears and stones. La ilaha illallah. This child was observing from a distance from the church. He was seeing the condition of Abu Abdullah. He began running towards the battlefield. Lady Zainab stopped him. She tried to hold him back, but he ran towards the battlefield. La ilaha illallah. He went into the battlefield. He stood before that Malhoun and Abu Abdullah. Before that Malhoun was about to strike his uncle he said to him oh lonely one do you wish to strike my uncle then kill me first that sword came down this was a child the flower of al Hassan. he put his hands in front of his face the sword came down upon his hands no, 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 no. he fell in the laps of his uncle crying the second moment that the heart of al Hussein was broken Ya Allah Oh uncle He was martyred in the very lap of Allah All of the companions All of the companions on the day of Ashura The members of the house of Allah they were martyred only one time. They tasted death only one time. But Abu Abdullah was martyred again and again in the day of Ashura. Because when Qasim ibn al Hassan fell upon the lands of Karbala, Al Hussein died right there. When Ali al Akbar fell, Al Hussein died right there. His own shahada was very easy. La ilaha illallah. Wala hawla wala quwwata illa billahi al-ghali al-adheem. Wa sallallahu ala al-baqeen ala al-hussain. Brothers, the salah time is coming soon. Come closer, come and join and lament for Qasim ibn Hassan, for Abba Abdullah. Do not be shy, these are the nights of Muharram. Lady Fatima is watching upon you. Recite with your lady upon the name of Allah Hussein. to recite I won't start the martyr until I hear every voice cry for Hussein <laughs> Mashallah I want everyone's voices together <laughs> Alhamdulillah. You're speaking to your mother Zahra. Mashallah, Mashallah, Abandillah, 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 Allah, 
Master, I stand in front of you, seeing you alone. Master, I stand in front of you, seeing you alone. Uncle, how can I bear all this? Allow me to go. What will I say to my father that I did not fight? What will I say to your mother that I'm still alive? Master, I stand in front of you, seeing you alone. Uncle, how can I bear all this? Allow me to go. Oh, what will I say to my father that I did not fight? What will I say to your mother that I'm still alive? Uncle Hossein, let me defend you, my master. Uncle Hossein, let me defend you, my master. Uncle Hossein, let me defend you, my master. Uncle, let me defend you, my master. Uncle Hossein, let me defend you, my master. Master, I stand in front of you, seeing you alone. Master, I stand in front of you, seeing you alone. Uncle, how can I bear all this? Allow me to go. What will I say to my father that I did not fight? What will I say to your mother that I'm still alive? Uncle Hossein, let me defend you, my master. Uncle Hossein, let me defend you, my master. Uncle Hossein, let me defend you, my master. Let me defend you, my master, Uncle Hossein. Let me defend you, my master. My father taught me of your love. My aunt nurtured me. I grew with Ambos. My uncle showed me loyalty. Those thirsty days under the sun trained me for today. Promising your mother Zahra to die for Hussein. I saw my father approach death but weeping for you. He did not care for the poison but crying for you. My Hussein will soon be alone. Who will defend you? I'm here on behalf of Hassan. Let me fight for you, Uncle Hossein. Let me defend you, my master, Uncle Hossein. Let me defend you, my master, Uncle let me defend you, my master. Call out about the long call. Let me defend you, my master. Call. Let me defend you, my master. On Zainab is weeping with 
Bitter she finds no solace And Zainab is weeping Bitter she finds no solace She holds onto the broken spear Struck in your Akbar Zahra, the heavens are with you Your son dies of thirst Let me be killed just to get him one drop of water the lips of Asghar have been crushed he no longer cries the lips of Asghar have been crushed he no longer cries his tears are unable to form his eyes have now dried Abbas laments for your daughter seeking the river let me be cut into pieces for all of your children uncle Hussein let me defend you my master Hussein, let me defend you, my master. Uncle Hussein, let me defend you, my master. Uncle Hussein, let me defend you, my master. Listen to the Musiba of Qasim. My armor is weighing on me. My shield is, is too big. My armor is weighing on me. My shield is too big. As long as my sword is with me, I'm fighting for him. The thirst is killing within me. I call a father. Give me the strength of Haydar to not leave my master. Master, my blood pours on my eyes, for I cannot see. Master, my blood pours on my eyes, for I cannot see. They are striking from every side. Uncle, please help me. I lie helpless upon the ground, yet they do not leave. The hooves of horses are crushing my ribs into me. The hooves of horses are crushing my ribs into me. Uncle, I ask to forgive me. I leave you alone. Uncle, I ask you forgive me. I leave you alone. I hear the prophet calling me, but how can I go? Hassan, my father, don't take me. Hussein is not free. Hassan, my father, don't take me. Hussein is not free. Strangers with their swords are surrounding my family. Strangers with their swords are surrounding my family. Father Hassan, how can I leave my master? 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 Father. 
how can I leave my master, father, Hassan? How can I leave my master, father? How can I leave my master, father, Hassan? How can I leave my master, father, Hassan? How can I leave my master, father, Hassan? How can I leave my master, father? How can I leave my master? I have one wish for you, my master, that one day you will call me your servant, call me your servant. I have one wish for you, my master, that one day you servant, call me your servant. I know that I am a sinner and I am unworthy. I know that I am a sinner and I am unworthy. I know that I am a sinner and I am unworthy. But your love allows my eyes to cry for your tragedy. I beg you, Hussein, my mother Zahra. I beg you, Hussein, my mother Zahra. Master, call my name to what kind of my Lord, your Hussein. Hussein, say a day, your Hussein, your Hussein, say a day, your Hussein, your Hussein, say a day, your Hussein, your Hussein, your Hussein, your Hussein, say a day, your Hussein. Saying, I now stand here, far away from you, crying out with tears, call me back to you, call me back to you. I now stand here, far away from you, crying out with tears. To you. I send my salons to you, the land of Karbala. I send my salons to you, the land of Karbala. I wish to die in my sorrows for you, O Karbala. I send my salons to you, the land of Karbala. I send my salons to you, the land of Karbala. I wish to die in my sorrows for you, O Karbala. Call me Karbala. Take away my pain. Call me Karbala. Take away. Karbala, inshallah, call me Karbala, call me Karbala, mashallah, mashallah, take away my pain, call me Karbala, 
MashaAllah, MashaAllah, take away my pain. I wish to visit my master who said, Your sign, your sign, say it, your sign, your sign, say it, your sign. Hassan, 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 Ya Zainab, 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 أين المنتقي أين المنتقي اللهم أنجل وليك الفرج اللهم أنجل وليك الفرج اللهم أنجل وليك الفرج بن محمد وآل محمد سلوات